Benedica. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Whether it's the evening or the morning or the mid afternoon, we're together. This is our new playlist, Artist Rewind, the ultimate intimate conversation with your favorite artist. Also, if you want to see more of this episode unlocked, all access, join our Patreon. We have an all access VIP backstage pass on this channel. Also, if you're part of the Talking Wax tier, the first Saturday of every month, we do a vinyl showdown and you walk away with vinyl sponsored by us, Talking Wax Adika Live. Now, tonight we have part two of our conversation with legendary bass player Bob Daisley. We went over last week some great content about Gary Moore along with Eric Singer. Tonight it is part two of the conversation. I think we're going to kick it off with a little... Uh, Bark at the Moon. Bark at the Moon was a special concert for me. It was the first time I ever got to see Ozzy Osbourne. I remember it very well. The opening act was Motley Crue, Shout at the Devil. So let's take it from me, everybody. Mr. Bob Daisley and Eric Singer. Roll it. Bam. Bam. Chuck and Wax. Uh -huh. Bark at the Moon. Now, now, did you do the tour, Bob, on that? On the when Motley Yes, Crew? yeah, it was a oh, world tour. Yeah, the world tour. All of America that. and Canada and Europe and Scandinavia and Japan, everywhere. I remember going because the crew opened up that Bark at the Moon, and that you believe that's right. Yeah, Motley Crew were opening up for all our shows. They were on tour with us for weeks. When we were on tour with Ozzy, um, we'd always have these crazy parties backstage. He would come onto our bus and say, "I'm riding with you guys to the next city," and he'd fucking reach into his into his coat pocket or his pants and pull out. He goes, he'd pull out like two huge bags of cocaine. And he goes, oh, "I've got bags of this shit." Jakey that, Lee was in the band. Great player, Jake. Brilliant player. Jakey Lee and uh, was was Randy Castillo on the drums on that one? No, Carmine. Uh, no, no, no. It was first of all, it was Carmine and Peace. Okay. And then, okay. Tom, and then Tommy Aldrich came back because Tommy had actually played on the album on Bark at the Moon. Mm -hmm. And uh, but but they ended. Ozzy and Sharon ended up sort of not very happy with Tommy. And, and got rid of him after he'd recorded. But the thing is with Tommy, his forte is playing live. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, ha he, he, he has some challenges in the studio, and that's, you know, that's what they were getting upset about. And then after we got the album in, in, in the can, they got rid of it. It was a bit like sort of shutting the gate after the horse had got out, you know. So it was a bit silly, really. But they got Carmine in to do the tour, and then they had a fallout with Carmine, and they got Tommy back. Wow. 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 A great record. It was a great record. It was a great time. Remember the tour? I remember that. Yeah. Being a kid well, that was... third album was supposed to be Ozzy, me, Randy, and and uh, and Tommy Aldridge. Wow. But obviously, in, in March 82, um, Randy was killed in that plane crash. The British rock singer Ozzy Osbourne, formerly with the group Black Sabbath, escaped injury when a plane made two low passes over the house in Florida where he was staying with his present band and then crashed into it. But the group's lead guitarist and makeup artist were killed. Keith Hindle reports. A private plane buzzed the house in Leesburg, Florida, where the group was staying. On the third pass, the pilot clipped their tour bus, parked outside, and ploughed into the house, killing the group's lead guitarist, Randall Rhodes, and the makeup artist, Rachel Youngblood. He also killed himself. Ozzy Osbourne was sitting in the bus at the time, but somehow survived unhurt. I remember doing shows with um, Gary when I was with Ozzy, and he had Craig Gruber playing, Neil Carter, and 
or Neil Murray, or he might have had Neil Murray for a minute. Yeah, I think it was Craig Groover when I when I was saw him. Yeah, I saw mm. Gary in 1983 right. at, at Cardi's in Houston. I was visiting my brother, and I literally moved to L.A. about five months later. And it was Ian Pace on drums. I think Craig Gruber maybe, but they played at a club. And um, and then I moved yeah, to Cardi's. I, we, we played Cardi's with Uriah Heep. That's it's mentioned in my book because that's the first show that we did on that U.S. tour with Uriah Heep after Randy got killed that morning. Mm, really, it was, uh, and I remember crying on stage at Cardi's. I had to turn my back to the audience because when we started to do the song um, "The Wizard." Because it reminded me of Randy, and I had to turn my back because it was just so sad. You know, Randy had just been killed the next year in '83 with Jakey Lee on. Interesting. Did you now? Did you know mm. Randy before he was in Ozzy? The story with that, I'm not clear. Did you I? Yeah, did you know Randy before? No, 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 no. no. Okay. Nobody knew who Randy Rhodes was. You know, it, it was uh, that story's in my book as well. Where I, I, David Arden, who was Don Arden's son, Sharon's brother, um, he asked me to go up to Ozzy's place to to just meet him and have a play and and see how it would feel. So I, I caught the train and Ozzy met me at the station. We went to his house and he had a rehearsal room built onto his house and we we um we had a play there with uh, some local guys that he had and i don't know who they were i can't remember uh, um there was a guitarist and a drummer i mean they're okay they weren't bad they were nice enough guys but when ozzy and i went for a cup of tea in the kitchen after we'd, we'd had a bit of a knock around for a while i, I said well you know I, he said would you be interested in because i'd just come out of rainbow not not long before that and Ozzy said, are you interested? Do you want to put something together? I said, I'd love to, because I liked Ozzy. I got on very well with him. I thought, yeah, this would be enjoyable. It, it, it's, you know, it, it'd work. I said, but to be honest with you, I have to be honest with you, Ozzy. I, I said, I'm not so, so sure about these other two guys. I said, they're okay. They play all right. They're nice enough guys. They look fine and all the rest of it. But I wouldn't call them world class. He said, oh, hang on a minute. And he walked out of the kitchen back into the rehearsal room. And I say, I heard him say, Okay, fellas, you can pack up, you can go home, it's not working out. And that was it, they're gone. But then after that, he <laughs> said to me, I did see this guitar player in L.A. He's really good. He's a guitar teacher. His name's Randy Rhodes. I said, well, get him over. Let's have a look at that, you know. You see, Ozzy had already told Randy that um, he had the gig. But then Ozzy came back to England and really wanted an English-based band. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even though he'd said to Randy, Okay, you've got the gig. It, it, it wasn't going to, you know, it wasn't going to happen at first until I said I, I'm not big on these two guys, and that's when he told me about Randy. And I said, "We'll get him over." And David Arden said he didn't want to fly Randy over. He said, "No, he's unknown. Nobody's heard of him. We don't know how good he is." Da 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 da. da you know all that stuff. You know. So eventually, Ozzy and I talked David Arden into getting Randy over, and David Arden's words were, and he still says it. He said. Against my better judgment, I paid for this young, unknown kid to come over and get the band going with, with Bob and Ozzy. And that, and that was it. That's how it started. We started auditioning drummers then and writing stuff at the same time. Wow. Wow. Mm. Incredible. It's great. You know, it's funny, Randy, I, you know, as a kid before anything, didn't know nothing about him. I, I always thought he was an English guy. Like, because he or he had. Oh, he really? Had, he just had that look. He looked a lot like Mick Ronson or David Bowie. He did. He had that. Yes, yeah, so I think he modeled on. himself on 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 the on the whole Bowie band image thing. That it looked, um, it looked great. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, he had the look, everything, the whole the whole swagger. I mean, the first you remember the first time when you got the when you guys are in the studio jamming together and you heard him play in front of you the first time, just plug in and play, then you, you probably, what did you say to yourself when you heard? Well, Randy and I got on so well together and we started playing and we we're just sort of jamming about just playing anything and nothing sort of thing, you know? And I remember at the, right at the same time, we, we stopped playing, we looked at each other and we virtually said it at the same time. Wow. Good play it. Or, or I like your way, the way you play it or something like that mm. along those lines. And we both said it together at the same time. 
Wow. And it was, um, yeah, you, you see, I, I was very impressed with, with Randy, and he, he was obviously a great player. But don't forget, I, I'd just come out of playing with Richie Blackmore, so there was a pretty high standard expected of, you know. <laughs> A, a guitarist at the time it wasn't like wow oh wow where did this guy come i mean that did come eventually we started th thinking wow this guy is really good you know the more it went on and the more um song ideas we were putting together and that you know it was uh, it was turning into that i remember arthur sharp came down from jet records to monmouth where we were rehearsing and auditioning drummers and writing the stuff and and when we played him some tapes of what we'd done, he, and and he and he was just blown away with Randy. He said, "God, what planet's this guy from?" And that's that's where that was his words. I remember. Oh, well, you know, it's so crazy listening to you talk, Bob. Like I just came from Rainbow, and I, it, and in that era of Rainbow was such a great version of Rainbow. I mean, you <laughs> each act that you've touched. I don't know what you the water you were drinking as a kid growing up, but it's like what are the odds that a guy like Eric, a guy like him, would go from this project that's a great project to the next one that's getting a, another great, better project? He's one and one. It keeps getting better and better. Yeah, it happened like that. I mean, I, I feel very grateful for for the for the people that I have played with. You know, it's it's been. You know, such a trip, all, all of them, every one of them, you know, and, and I often think to myself, you know, when I reread my book after writing it and I, and I, I sort of sat, sat back and, and thought about what I'd just read and what I'd just written, I thought, God, all this stuff happened to one person. It's, you know, I, I really feel, you know, honoured and grateful and privileged to have been able to play with so many great people. Obviously, they weren't doing me a favour by saying, "Well, we'll we'll let you join the band because you like playing with it." You know, they wanted me in there because I was, um, you know, fitting the bill, sort of thing. But yeah, it 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 is. I agree. It's 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 a strange thing to look at it all and and see how it's the, the lineage of of you know. <laughs> all those great acts it, it's just insane because you'll think of your favorite bass players but then you know they go from project to project it, it's it's very rare um do you still have the the bass that you were playing back then like when, when you were your aussie bass your rainbow do you still have or did you get rid of you i've game? still got yeah it's a 1961 precision that i, I stripped the paint off mm -hmm. the things i wish i'd no, never done mm-hmm but in 1972 i bought that bass it was only 11 years old at the time that was when i was in a blues band in england called chicken shack and uh the bass i bought it from um orange music in in the west end but i bought that bass and it was a little beaten up and worn and and i showed it to clive colson who was um he was working for led zeppelin at the time and he lived in the flat below me. We were close mates. And he said, oh, we'll take the paint off. And he said, it's a bit beaten up. Everybody does that now. So he and I, he and I took the paint off and varnished it. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. No, wow. It's because, you know, he, Clive's no longer with us. And, you know, I miss him dearly. And he was a lovely guy. And he, he helped me a lot in my career, bless him. And... Um, it's because he and I did it together that, that that bass has that sort of memory in it. It's 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 kind of falls into the category of things that I wish I'd never done mm -hmm. by taking the paint off because it takes the originality of away. But it's because Clive and I did it together, and and that bass has been the workhorse. It's, it's done so many tours, so many records, so many TV appearances. It's done a lot. That's been the the main one, and yes, I still have that one. I had a, um, it's a 62 Olympic white precision with, with the uh, tortoiseshell guard on it. That, that That's another one that I've done a lot of stuff with. I used yeah. that on the, um, some of Gary's stuff and one of the last gal albums that I did with Gary, Power of the Blues, I used um, that, that white precision on. Latin with the power of the blues. Now you have ronnie lane's bass i saw on your website i do wow yeah that's there's only one of those in the world it was the one that tony's and matus 
made it for him in about oh, it must have been like 70, 71 or somewhere around there because it, it's the it's the black one with the two railings on it, and and Ronnie Lane used that a lot with Rod Stewart and the faces, and so yeah, I have that one. It's um, yeah, it's 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 funny to hold that bass just to, when when you see how much Ronnie Lane used it and and how unique it is but by being just a one-off. There's one in the world, and that's it. see the back of it where his belt buckle would you know oh sweat. yeah wow yeah yeah they got a little belt wear on it and yeah and his frets where his fingers like you could see okay that was his main part these that's where he would play mostly his favorite notes his spot on the bass that's worn out on the front yeah 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 i mean it's not as worn as you might think but but it is yeah you can see yeah it's got the belt buckle wear at the back and it's pretty and that sort of thing. Now, yeah. that, that, that coffin case I saw that you put, is that, is that the case that it came with, the coffin case? I think it might have been a case that Tony Zemaitis uh, made for him to, to put it in. It's, yeah, it's just, it's just, it looks like a casket. <laughs> yeah, it did, it did. Did you see mm. that, Eric, on, on his site? Did you see a photo I've of seen that? it. I've, I've seen the instruments on his site, but I don't remember seeing the case in particular. It's pretty cool. I mean, yeah. It's, it's history. That's rock and roll history right there. Yeah, Bob, yeah. Bob, I have a question real quick. I forget. I know you told me before, but I don't remember. Refresh my memory, um, because I saw you. Yeah, go I on. saw you play with Widowmaker at the Cleveland Agora, but I didn't remember how you met Ariel Bender or Luther, as his real name was. How did you meet Luther? I left my home for fortune. I found a lot of fame and sorrow. In a pub called the Roebuck on on Kings Road in in London. Um, I was out with uh, a friend of mine, Phil Carlo, who was uh, Phil was a, a, one of the road crew with Bad Company, when right. he and I were out at the Roebuck this night, just sort of, you know, just putting ourselves around, looking for see who's about, and because I was looking for something to do, and um, and it was Phil that pointed out Luther. He said, "See that guy over there? That's Luther Grosvenor. He used to be in Spooky Tooth, and then he was Ariel Bender in Mott the Hooper and that, you know." And Luther was looking, to, funnily, funnily enough, just at the right time, Luther was looking to put a band together. And he, he already had a drummer. It was Paul Nichols from right. Linda's Farm. And he said to me, yeah, I'm, he said, I'm looking for, for people to put my band together. You'd be interested. And, and then he and I got talking and, and he, he came round to my place the next day. And then we met up at his place with Paul Nichols and, and then the Widowmaker thing started. And first of all, we were going to try to keep it just a three-piece. Oh, okay. Just a trio. Um, but but we were trying to get, you know, signed to a record label and, and they all wanted a, a front man. And so we ended up getting Steve Ellis, who was um, the front man for a band called uh, The Love Affair. <laughs> who had a, a, a big hit with Everlasting Love in, in about, I don't know, 66, 67, somewhere around there. Wow. And then Steve Ellis brought in Hugh Lloyd Langton, who'd been with um, <clears throat> uh, um, Hawkwind, and he, he was a good player. So then we don't make it turn into a five-piece. And we, the last week that we had to look at getting a deal and getting signed because we, we all agreed, okay, we've done this long enough and we still haven't been signed. If it doesn't happen this week, we may as well break up and go our separate ways. But Don Arden with Jet Records signed us that week. <laughs> so that was all good. I saw you guys play the Cleveland Agora. I, I think you did. You guys only tour America one time. No, twice. Seventy six, we opened up for ELO. Wow. And then at the end of six weeks of uh, opening up for ELO, we did a five week tour of our own of, of you know clubs and and that's smaller venues. And then the following year in seventy seven, um, we we did another US tour, and that was with John Butler. On vocals, he was a great singer. I love John Butler's voice. Great, he's a, he actually sang on a track recently. Of I, I did a tribute to Gary Moore album, and it has lots of um, great players and great names on there. 
and uh, and John Butler sang on a, a couple of tracks of that. Every time I think of you, that's why. Remember, it was '76 because I was in Cleveland. Yes, I remember, I remember playing Cleveland. Yeah, yeah, I was a big Mott the Hoople fan, and I loved Ariel Bender in the band because he was, you know, he he looked like a star, and he had a lot of personality on stage. Oh, yeah, he had charisma and style pouring out of him, Luther. He was, it was really a one-off. I mean, he was a little eccentric <laughs> in his dress and and in his behavior and in his playing, but you know, he was so unique. Really was his yeah. a lot of style. I mean, when he joined Mark the Hoople and took Mick Ralph's place, because Mick Ralph left to form Bad Company with, with Paul Rogers and Simon Kirk, and that, um, and then Luther took over uh, Mick's place in Mark the Hoople. Everybody said, "God, he's given that band a shot in the arm now." He'd, he'd made such a difference. He did. It was a big boot up the ass from Mark the Hoople, and they, they just came alive. Yeah, he, he he was more punky style guitar player, but he had a he was just such a great performer on stage. He looked great. Yeah, it's really original. I mean, he was a, you know original in his, you know, the way he presented himself and in his playing. Yeah, he was very cool. They offered me the job with uh, Mott Hooper. Would I like to join the band? And uh, what can I say? It kind of described the way he sounded. Oh yeah, that's Ariel Bender. <laughs> I saw them in '74 yeah. with him in Mata Hoopo. I saw him. Oh okay. Yep. What what a fantastic tour! Go, you know, you guys going out with ELO. I mean, you got two green hacks on that, and it's, it's all Jet. I guess it's Jet, both Jet bands. You know, the label. Well, that was it. Don Hard and Jet Records. They they had ELO, and in 1976, ELO were huge. I mean, we did really big venues everywhere. And uh, it kind of spoiled us, really, because the first six weeks of the tour, we were with ELO and we were on their private plane with limos to and from the plane at the airports and the you know, oh, really? good hotels and all that. And then after six weeks of doing that with ELO, we did a five-week tour of our own in station wagons and commercial flights. And, and uh, you know, it was just, yeah, that was pretty tough going after after being spoilt on uh, on the first part of the tour. Because you also did Ingve, and I was asking Eric. Uh, Eric was just saying that Sherinian wasn't in the band. Okay, so that they never played together in the same in the same no. lineup. Okay. okay. In fact, Bob will tell you there was a funny story with that. Bob came in to do the Ingve record with, when Jeff Glixman. The producer had produced Gary Moore and Black Sabbath, and he brought. Yeah, that's where I met uh, Jeff Glixman. Yeah, with Joe Lynn Turner, and we went to Yamashiro, up in the Hollywood Hills, with Jim Lewis, the A and R guy from Polygram Mercury, and they had a meeting with Joe, Jeff Glixman, Bob, and myself. And remember, Bob, that the record company wanted to bring Bob and I in to be in the band and create a new band around Ingve with Joel and Turner, Bob Daisy, myself. And yes. Ingve, and Ingve wouldn't do it. He wouldn't remember that he wouldn't get rid of the Swedish guys. Really? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they were brothers. Those, the Swedish guys, weren't they? The keyboard player yeah. and the drummer, They're both great players, but, but um, right, yeah. Well, yeah. Jim yeah. Wanted, he, well, Jim Lewis wanted to kind of do the same thing. Like what Whitesnake had done, put it in a, some kind of an American or a band of guys known from other bands and create a kind of a all-star band, if you will, for Ingve. But Ingve wouldn't go for it. But we had a meeting at Yamashiro yeah. on the top of the hill in Hollywood yeah. Hills. You remember that, Bob? Yeah. 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 But I wasn't really interested in in joining um Ingve anyway. I mean he's a great player. I mean he he really was. And and um I remember he and the and the two brothers came to my room at the hotel and tried to talk me into joining the band. But I, I was just too stuck on staying with Gary and I was very happy with Gary. And, and I was just doing that at the end of our, our U.S. tour with Gary. 
I just did those tracks on Ingve's album, you know, j- just to sort of um, a- as a guest kind of thing. And I think it was only four or five tracks anyway. But yeah. uh, I, I wasn't really interested in, in you know, leaving Gary and, and going with Ingve anyway. All right, before we get out of here, Eric and, and, and Bob, before we get Bob, really quick, what are you working on now? You have you have a part two of a book would tell us no 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 part two of the book um each each reprinting of the book i just add a bit of the epilogue at the end Mm. to bring it up to date of so and so's died or this change or i did this or this has happened or or whatever so it it all remains the same except for the epilogue and, and then i put in new bits to bring it up to date and for each new printing but but i've also done some instrumental stuff with a drummer that i worked with um, with john lord and he was also the drummer on some of the tracks of the tribute to gary moore and we did all that stuff in his studio rob grosser and he and he um, had some ideas for some instrumental stuff that we started working on together and they just they turned out so well um, and we've got that happen, and, and and it's just all instrumental stuff. It's kind of a little bit in the vein of '60s surfing music, but with a, with a different um, facet to it. That's a little bit kind of trippy and spacey, like Pink Floyd stuff. So it's very interesting, and and we've called the uh, the act. There's just two of us, really, because. You know, we, we did a lot of stuff in the studio together and Rob played guitar parts and keyboard parts and that. And, and, but we called it The Upstarts. <clears throat> and uh, we've done an album's worth. We've got more stuff um, in the can ready to uh, mix and that. And it's just, it's really, really enjoyable, really sort of easy listening, pleasant listening. And everybody I've played it to, they just love it. Oh, that's good. So um, I, I think you might even find one or two films uh little film clip things with some of the music on youtube it's just called the upstarts one of the songs is is called seabird flavor um because i called it seabird flavor because it reminds me of the song that fleetwood mac did in the 60s called albatross it's got that kind of vibe there's a monty python sketch where he's selling an albatross and and uh, the guy comes up to him and he says, um, "What flavor is it?" And he said, "Well, it's fucking seabird flavor." What? <laughs> so I called the track "Seabird Flavor" after the Monty Python sketch and after the song oh, "Albatross." Great. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> hey, it was good talking this has with been you, Bob. And enjoyable. It's really good talking to you, mate. And and you too, Eric. Little Elvis there. It's uh, <laughs> okay, hey. Thank it's you, John. Blessings Lee. to you both. Yes. <laughs> See you bye. then. Bye. Okay. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. A big thank you to Bob Daisley for spending some time with us and Eric Singer. And most of all, thank you for being here with us. We'll be back here Saturday night, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time with some more stories and more fun. Until then, kids, it's only rock and roll, and we like it. I'll see you later. Now get out of here, you crazy kids. Mwah! Bam! Bam! <laughs> Stop right there, everybody. You're not getting off that easy. Right here, there's going to be a box here, and there's going to be a box right over there. Please click on that and check out some other past content that you might not have seen. And please, if you have not subscribed, subscribe. Hit that bell to be reminded when we're coming on. Until then, kids, who loves you, baby? We do. Now get out of here, you crazy kids. It's nighty night night. Bam.